Adrian Rafel is the author of Thinking Inside the Box. And I just want to mention, if I'm showing you the book, it is here at the St. Johnsbury Athenaeum if you're in the neighborhood and you can check it out. Um, Adventures with Crosswords on the Puzzling People Who Can't Live Without Them. Uh, her essays, sorry, uh, What It Was For, This Book of Poetry, which is here and which is fantastic. And um, we also have By Plane and By Sea, which is a joint book with Adrian and Jenny Land from the St. Johnsbury Academy. So that is a special thing that you could probably only find here at the afternoon. You can check it out. Her essays, poetry, and criticism appear in The New Yorker, Poetry, The New Republic, The Atlantic, Paris Review, Daily, Slate, Lana Turner Journal, Poets and Writers, The Iowa Review, and other publications. Born in New Jersey and raised in Vermont, Rafel holds a PhD in English from Harvard University, an MFA in poetry from the Iowa Writers Workshop, and an AB summa cum laude from Princeton University. She is currently a lecturer in the Princeton Writing Program. And for a lot more information on Adrian, go to her site at adrianrafel.com. And I put the address in the chat function. So if you turn that on, you'll see the link there. There's a lot of information of um, upcoming uh, virtual events where you could see Adrian again. And I just wanted to mention this one. Next Tuesday, a week from tonight, she'll be at virtually Prairie Lights Bookstore in Iowa City, Iowa for the kickoff of the paperback edition. So you can see her there. Um, there it is. It's yellow in the paperback version. Um, and that'll be a, a discussion with uh, Micah Bateman. That's it for me. Here is Adrian Rafer. Oh, gosh. Can everybody hear me? Okay. <laughs> Hi. Oh, wow. It's so wonderful to be virtually here and with all of you. And um, Bob, I can't thank you enough for inviting me to the Athenaeum. Um, it's just, I mean, I love the Athenaeum so, so much. And it's, um, I feel like I'm there as much as I can be. So it's so delightful. Um, so I thought I would just start off with reading just a couple of minutes um, from the introduction to thinking inside the box. And I'll get to read from the paperback version for the first time, which is exciting to me. Um, so the paperback comes out in a week. And um, so, yeah, I'll just read a couple of pages from the introduction because um, it like uh, just it features secretly fe um, Jenny McKenzie, who's on makes a and Bob mentioned um, Jenny Lynn's book, she makes a secret cameo in here. And my parents make um, a very blatant cameo. They, my dad especially really loves this part. So <laughs> I'll just read a couple of pages and then um, we'll go from there. So thank you all for coming. Um, I started writing this book when I was three. That's when I discovered what the alphabet could do. Using only a combination of these shapes on the page, I could beam down messages from my brain, which other people could put back together, making my message get wormed into their brains. Whenever I rode in the car, I'd play the alphabet game with my brother. We each had to find the letters of the alphabet in order, somewhere in the landscape zooming by, shouting out the letter and its sight upon sighting. Whoever got from A to Z fastest was the winner. Dairy Queen, Quiznos, and Jiffy Lube became shrines. When I was growing up, children's book author, Raw Dahl's reader par excellence, Matilda, was my hero. I stared at the towel rack in the bathroom so hard my eyes blurred, willing myself to move something by shooting telekinetic beams from behind my eyeballs the way Matilda used her mental power to pick up chalk. But I was even more excited about the other things that letters could do, how letters could arrange themselves into any words and how certain combinations of letters suggested other ones, even when they seemed unrelated. Monday nights during high school, my family had crossword races. My father would make photocopies of the Monday New York Times puzzle hand them out to us and send us to separate corners of the house. At his shout, 
we'd flip them over and begin. I'd scramble to finish before hearing my brother crow, done. I'd scrawl the final capital letters and rush into the living room where my mom would be coolly reading the rest of the day's art section, having breezed through the grid several minutes earlier. Dad would be pretending not to care anymore, a few scattered blank squares mocking him. As a senior in high school, I had to do a capstone research project that included a community service component. I did mine about crosswords. The centerpiece was a spiral bound book of crosswords that I brought into a local eighth grade classroom, along with blank grids for the students to try their hands at puzzle making. My puzzles back then were objectively terrible. I didn't realize you should make the grid symmetrical or that all the letters should interlock with each other. So my puzzles looked like jack-o'-lanterns instead of neat quilts, clues slash snaggletooth across the page. Thinking inside the box investigates the crossword from all sides. I start with the crossword's origins, tracking how that first crossword in 1913 evolved from novelty to craze to routine. I construct a puzzle from soup to nuts, and I go behind the scenes with crossword editors to discover how a crossword goes from rough draft to publication. I investigate the myths around crosswords. Are crosswords frivolous toys that fritter your brain away? Will crosswords stave off dementia? I go to crossword tournaments to learn from the best solvers and constructors in the business. I even take a crossword themed ocean crossing aboard the Queen Mary too. The more the crossword changes, the more it stays the same. The crossword is a reflection of everything happening around it, but it's also an anchor. In the wake of a particularly harrowing presidential election, an editor at the New Yorker said he found himself turning to the crossword puzzle as a life raft of stability in a world that had gone topsy-turvy. It's no accident that the crossword grew up during World War I and that the New York Times introduced its crossword during World War II. No matter how chaotic life is, solving a crossword puzzle gives you a sense of control. Seeing where the letters lead you sets the mind free. And then the book goes on from there. <laughs> if I unmuted everybody, we could all laugh together, but then it would be chaos, so I won't. But thank you, Adrian. Do you want to show us any images? Do you want, um, I, I will have some questions. These are the starter questions, but how do you want to proceed? Um, Sure, why don't I show a few images just because I started talking a tiny bit about the history of the crosswords. I can just, um, I just have queued up a couple of images um, from sort of the early um, history of the crossword that I'll just show and I'll end with like a little of um, snippet of crossword music. It's just, um, just to kind of, um, you know, <laughs> so we can see what the crossword looks like. It's so visual. Um, so I'll just share my screen. Um, here we go. And nope, not that, that, this. <laughs> um, can everybody see this now? Yeah, so this is, um, I mentioned the crossword started in 1913. So this is actually where the crossword first appeared. It appeared in a supplement to, a, in the newspaper, the New York world in the fun section of the New York world. And so, on the right hand side, you can see the where the crosswords sort of appeared amidst all the puzzles and cartoons. And so this is what the first crossword puzzle looks like. So it's, you know, it's pretty similar, although different. It's, it's like a crossword except tilted and into this diamond shape with a little donut hole in the center. Um, you can see also the numbering scheme looks really different. You go from two to three. They don't do a cross and down. It's from two to three. Um, some of the clues are really super weird in this. Like they they don't really standardize. The, the word dove appears twice, um, both as the answer to a bird and a pigeon. Nowadays, that's like a huge no-no. 10 to 18, so 10 down. The clue is the fiber of the gomuti palm. What is that? I don't know what that is. 
<laughs> Nobody knows what that is. Do any readers of the New York world know what the fiber of the gomuchi palm is? No, <laughs> they don't. The word is do, D-O-H. And like, they didn't have Homer Simpson to go do, you know, <laughs> so they can't, they have to glue it like that. Um, and so, yeah, this is something, this is, I love when crosswords, basically when I'm gonna like rapid fire through a few images of when crosswords start to become a huge fad, all this like crossword um, stuff starts bubbling up in the world. So like, this is um, a cartoon by Ernie Bushmiller, who if anybody is a comics cartoon fan, he becomes super famous. Um, he's the creator of Nancy, the cartoon Nancy. So this was his earliest effort. He drew the grids for the crossword puzzle in the New York world. And then he created this kind of uh, funny crossword cal cartoons. Um, the crossword puzzle book first comes out in 1924, which is when the crossword really goes viral. If I can use that word, um, it, it came bundled with a Venus brand pencil. Um, this is what the crossword puzzle book looks like. This is the first time it was collected rather than just being in the newspaper. Um, yeah, the crossword puzzle book sold, its first series sold 123,000 copies. The second series sold 110,000 copies the same year. The third, like this thing was just like a major, major, major success. It basically, launched the publication house Simon and Schuster. Uh, these are some cool crossword fashions, fashions from the 20s, uh, crossword couture, a crossword bracelet. Um, this is, I love this so much. There was a Broadway musical in 1925 called the um, Puzzles of 1925 and features a crossword puzzle sanatorium. I guess for people who are either already insane from crosswords or are looking to go insane. I don't really know what the deal is, but I love this image just like, um, and then here I'll end with this little bit if you can, um, actually, I'm not sure. Let me see if I can, um, can you hear this? <laughs> Can't, anyway. Um, I think I'm just not gonna try to share the sound, it's too complicated. But anyway, there's a song that, um, <laughs> there was songs about crossword puzzles. The, um, I, just, I just wanted to show you guys some of the, um, those original images because they're so wild and fun. I just realized I answered you saying that we couldn't hear it, but I was muted. That's gonna be, you know, it's gonna be a crossword and a, and a dictionary entry, muted. Or are you unmuted yet? Ay, ay, yeah. ay. How many of us have been on that? Um, there is a question in the queue. I'm going to start with that one. So does, capital letters, working crosswords stave off dementia? Ah, so there's conflicting research on this. Um, there, ha there is research on this, first of all, <laughs> which is great to me. Of like, There's like several different scientific studies where people say, you know, Let's look at these um, groups of um, people and see whether the crossword stays off dementia. One group of scientific studies says, yes, it does. Look, we have this group of people who did the crossword and the control group who did it. And the like one group, they, are, they don't have as much dementia as the control group. So great, wonderful. And then there's another scientific study that says, well, you didn't account for all the other like factors in their lives. And also there's studies that show that it might stave off dementia for a couple of years, but then it comes, <laughs> it comes and gets you. It's um, basically crosswords, like they're, <laughs> I think like it's more of a placebo effect. And also if you want them to stave off dementia, <laughs> like please believe in them. I, I mean, I think like um, there is good science around, you know, training your brain to do different kinds of things is always going to be good for your brain. And the crossword naturally makes you think in lots of different ways because to solve different clues, even within the same puzzle, you have to think in different ways. You have to think logically straightforward. Okay, I'm going to like, this is like a definition that I'm going to answer. Or, and then some clues you just say, 
no, it wants me to think of this clue just like a riddle. So your brain is always doing lots of different kinds of things when you're in a crossword. So it's good for your brain, um, whether it's Dave's off dementia, it's sort of up to you. There's another partial question. I'm gonna wait till it finishes. Um, so I'm going to ask one, which might be a longer answer, but we're going to come back to the chat. And at some point, I'll ask everybody to raise their hand. I'll let you ask your own questions. There's a lot of discussion, Adrian, about the New York Times puzzle and the evolution of the editors and who wanted to do what. What I was really shocked by was one of the early editors, I, I, and I think it was the New York Times, but correct me if I'm wrong. Anyway, one person passes it on to another person, and that person is basically bored, takes in all these puzzles submitted by readers, doesn't proof them, and they're actually awful. The clues are screwed up, and I don't know, there's a bunch of problems with it. Even though it was a craze, people were, I don't know, the editors seem to be sick of it or bored, but then there's a long succession of editors who get it better and better in many different ways. Can you talk about the early days and then the succession of editors at the Times? Sure, yeah. So actually, it's the first, the inventor of the crossword, Arthur Wynn, is the guy who gets bored with it. So um, he was the one who like, um, first created that first crossword that I showed you, the diamond shape. And he's the editor of the fun section of the New York world. So he invents this crossword basically as a way of, oh my gosh, I need something to fill the page in my big Christmas time supplement. What am I going to do? Great. I can stick a grid in there. A grid just fills a lot of space. Fantastic. Great. I got it. Um, then this crossword puzzle takes off. It becomes this sort of monster demon child of like, <laughs> not a monster child, but you know, like it becomes more than you bargain for. Um, he, the people love it. They clamor after it. Win never wanted to be a crossword editor. He gets sick of it and he just phones it in basically. He's like, well, I'm just going, this is fine. People will keep doing it. Um, people complain, um, long story short, basically he ropes in a secretary, a young secretary who's just been hired by the New York world. He ropes in the secretary to come help edit the crossword for him. Her name is Margaret Petherbridge and she marries a guy named Ferrer. So she's Margaret Ferrer. Um, Margaret Ferrer ends up being the first crossword editor at the New York Times, and she's like the grand dame of crosswords. She's incredible. She standardizes the American crossword. She goes from being sort of a um, this reluctant secretary roped in to help out with this editor who's phoning it in to becoming um, one of the like the the sort of premier first editor of crossword puzzles in America and one of the top uh, crossword editors of all time. There are some great questions here. I'm gonna to go to the chat since they're here um, and I will let people ask them. Let's see. Um, okay, this is the one that has a partial. Um, okay, in your opinion, Adrian, which is better, the American or British style of crossword? And that is from Sharon. <laughs> So Sharon, this is not loaded at all. Clearly. <laughs> <laughs> um, to explain for those of you who don't know, this is um, Sharon and Jeff, who are dear friends of our family. And Jeff's um, father is one of was was one of the best um, cryptic crossword makers of all time, and the maker of the hardest crossword puzzles, uh, some of the hardest crossword puzzles I've ever seen. So this is not a loaded question at all. Um, just very briefly, I'll explain if um, you don't know, or if um, the refresher, the difference between American and British crosswords. So essentially, um, when crosswords become super popular in America in the 20s, they also become extremely popular in Britain, but it's a little bit like um, in biology, if you have like a, you know, an animal that starts off the same, but then it evolves in slightly different tracks, it evolves in slightly different ways in America and Britain. So in Britain, um, it evolves into the cryptic crossword, which is basically a crossword with an extra level of wordplay that's always there. So in a cryptic crossword, you're never gonna have a straightforward definitional clue. You're always going to have uh, a clue always has, it's like 
wordplay element to it, something that tells you that the clue is scrambled or backwards, you have to anagram it. And then it's got like its sort of definition, it's its clue element. So it's like a, it's a riddle and a clue all at once. Um, so cryptic crosswords are, and I know some other people on here are really um, good at cryptic crosswords there. Um, Stephen Sondheim, the composer, right? Who, he basically poo pooed American crosswords, loved cryptics. Other, you know, there is, um, if it, there is definitely, um, they, they, people can do both, certainly. Um, I think cryptic crosswords are just, in, there's some incredible feats of staggering wordplay that American crosswords can't handle because they don't you can't do quite that much wordplay in them i think they're amazing but i think american crosswords um they can do stuff that british crosswords can't they can um cryptic crosswords don't care as much what the grid looks like basically because they're not um they don't have rotational symmetry like american crosswords do so american crosswords can do super cool visual things like american crosswords um you can get one my one of my favorite visual ones is like a spiral it's like it's a, all kind of about the Guggenheim Museum and it has like all these pieces of art that are in the Guggenheim so it's shaped in a spiral like the Guggenheim Museum and American crosswords can do interesting things with the visual like visual playful elements but British crosswords can do amazing things with wordplay so this is my diplomatic answer my transatlantic everybody can coexist in one place well done, Adrian. Well done. Here is a question or a, 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 yes, a question and a comment from Jenny McKenzie. She says, Adrian, you have some creative writing students listening in here. What was your favorite part of the writing process for this book? What was the hardest? Oh, wow. <laughs> Hi, Jenny. Um, so, wow. Um, my favorite, let's see, my favorite part of writing the book um, let's, I'd have to say, um, hmm, I, th I would say two things, like, um, early when I didn't know it was going to be a book actually was one of my favorite parts. Cause I really love the sort of initial moments of discovery when, um, you know, you don't know what the argument's going to be. You don't know exactly where you're going with it. Um, one of the first things I did for this book was um, I went and talked to um, Will Shorts, the New York Times cross editor. I went and interviewed him at his house and then I um, worked on writing up that interview and I didn't know where it was going at first. And then I was like finding out more about the crossword. So in this particular book, that sort of investigation, like discovering that there was this whole world and trying to like put that together, but without having the real pressure of like, this is a book, I just love that exploratory part of it. And then the other part that I like really loved writing too was the part where I was like trying to construct a crossword, but writing about trying to construct a crossword. That was like such a challenge. It was such like the poetry part of my brain just lit up. It was like, wow, <laughs> constructing a crossword is really hard. And I'm going to get to write about all the ways in which it's really hard. And I just like um, really dove into that. Um, so I think relatedly the hardest part, and I know I have some of my um, teachers on here, including Jenny, and they will laugh when I say this. Um, the hardest part for me was actually writing the argument, <laughs> writing the thesis, like getting to something. I mean, and this book doesn't really have an argument. The book's argument is basically crosswords, they're fun. <laughs> you know, like that's essentially like what we got. But then the more kind of serious bit of like um, crosswords are a way for you to gain control when everything is spiraling out around you, which has become even more. Uh, critical. I didn't know how how crucial the the heart of that was going to be when I was writing that. But of course, the idea of crosswords becoming a place where you can have control when everything is spiraling out around you has become really central <laughs> to what the crossword means to me. Um, but yeah, so exploring and having fun and kind of um, geeking out on constructing was the best part and trying to 
wrap it into any kind of argument is something that um, I let me say I am so glad I work I for editors. Thank goodness for editors. There is another very good question, and I, I think you mentioned this in the book, but uh, let's see, I lost my place in the chat here. Um, oops, hold on, I'm, I'm, I'm going to come back to it. Let's see here. Um, okay, this is from Robert Swartz. Is making a crossword puzzle still an art, or do computer apps make it so easy? Oh, so I, this is another great question. And I actually, um, it, it's something that crossword constructors were worried about when um, cr computer apps started coming up and being developed for crosswords. So the old school way of making a crossword is taking your graph paper and taking your pencil and drawing it out. And, um, you know, that's great and it takes forever. Um, a computer app, there are computer apps now that I use when I was constructing. And I think now about 100% of constructors use them. They just, um, you can slot all the letters in. It makes it perfectly symmetrical for you automatically. Um, you can also upload, this is sort of the crucial bit. You can upload um, your own kind of customized dictionaries of words. So if you think of like, you know, you can get Scrabble dictionaries, right? Like they're just words that it can appear on the Scrabble. Basically, um, expert crossword constructors make word lists of like the words, not only like the words that they um, are good for crosswords, they want in crosswords, and also they try to weight them so that like they don't get too much crossword ease, like you don't have too many Oreos and Aries and Oleos and um, ors and ots and ESEs and you don't have that much you try to like eliminate that stuff swimming around because it's very easy to rely on those crosswords so so um so the crossword apps so there is some art in the kind of back end of them actually there's a lot of like tech art in what goes into um the word list that you're making and developing and I also think that crossword apps, I mean, I know this, I, I actually really think they're great because they, um, they're they very accessible, they're very easy. Um, now there's even some like free ones that are very good. They really democratize the process and like they can get a lot of people really into it. And they also, um, yeah, I, and, and they also have up the bar, you know, you can't just like, it, you can't, it's not enough to be like, well, I used my graph paper and I came up with a puzzle that's symmetrical, so we're good, right? It's like, no, 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 now that's the baseline. Now crosswords can become even more clever. So it's really raised the stakes for them. So um, to me, it's kind of like, um, it feels similar to, okay, I don't have to, you know, I can write in longhand, but then I can also like write on a Word document. It doesn't like writing on my computer doesn't take away my creativity, it just, you know, gives more options. Here is another question somewhat related. This is from Alicia Woods. First of all, thank you for sharing with us in your hometown, all caps. Have you created many crosswords yourself? Can you explain the process a bit? You just told us a bit about the, um, the, the, the aid of a computer app. It, they did say, and perhaps you could talk here about your own experience the first time, or maybe it was the first time that you submitted to the New York Times. Yeah, so I wrote about this some in the book, but um, yeah, it's, um, and hi, it's good to see you and in my, it does kind of feel like I'm in my hometown. Um, this is great. Um, so the process of constructing a crossword, um, yeah, I do use the, I did use the apps. Um, so basically what, I didn't quite realize until trying it out is that 90, let's say 92% of constructing a crossword is making the grid with all the letters filled in correctly, right? So like you can basically, you can, um, and, and with all the letters filled in correctly, I don't mean like they, they just kind of create words that fit into a grid because the computer can do that for you you can press a button and the computer will fill in a crossword grid for you and it'll take 
uh, 0.001 seconds and the computer's grid will like function perfectly fine. And then you can like walk off at the end of the day, but the computer's grid can't do a bunch of things. It can't make a theme for you, right? So like you, uh, so like you can't have those like clever pun answers. The computer's not gonna come up with those, at least not yet. I, I give it five years, who knows? But like the computer's not gonna like make theme answers beautifully for you. A computer also, um, it won't say you're making a puzzle without a theme, but you have these like really super cool strings of 15 letters as like words or phrases that you want to put into your puzzle. Computer's not going to do that for you. And then a computer is also going to do what I said, crossword ease. Like it, it, it just kind of fills in whatever it wants to. So, so anyway, so, but a lot of the, but like the biggest challenge in crossword construction, the real heavy lift is how do you get the grid to function so that it all like you could, when you're solving it, it's smooth solving, right? So like you don't get stuck on, wow, these two, the only way I'm going to figure out how this like corner works is if I happen to know all these super esoteric uh rivers in france and that's great if you're um you know studying for ap euro and <laughs> you suddenly like know all the rivers in france are in the but if you're not in that brain space you want to make you want to like balance out the kinds of words you have across the grid you want to balance out even the um you know experts get really into like the kinds of references you know if you're crossing um an actress like uh, if you're crossing like a contemporary actress like Issa Rae, who's like a contemporary actress who stars in the HBO show Insecure and in a bunch of other things, but like, so she's got a great crossword name, Issa Rae. Uh, it's got S's and A's and I's and it's short and it's cool. You want to cross her with some kind of cultural reference that's maybe skews a little bit uh, more classical or, or like you could cross her with something that's like a sports reference or you could cross her with something, right? So it's this like balancing act and I know I'm sort of giving a lot of examples about it, but I was just so fascinated by when you're creating a grid that you want to appeal to as many people as possible. So like a New York Times audience, you want to like get the diversity of the New York Times audience. And you also want to get just diversity period into your crossword grid um, of all kinds. It's really, really difficult. The clues are super fun. Clues are great, clues are fun. Making up like way clever ways to clue certain words and phrases is fantastic. Uh, but you can do that, you, 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 know, you, you do that at the end. You get your grid locked and loaded, but you do that at the end because you can always change those around. Um, and in fact, that's the job, a crossword editor will often accept a grid even if they change 90% of the clues because grids are so hard to make and they, they take the time. Clues, they're fun. That was really fascinating because I don't think I quite got it that, you know, which came first, the words or the melody. Yeah. It's the grid. Oh, that yeah. is super informative. Um, some more comments here. This one from Sharon, who said, um, great explanation and diplomacy. Compliments to you. <laughs> and um, let's see, I missed one here. Whoop. Um, um, I, sorry, I've lost track of one of them that I wanted to ask, but Jenny McKenzie asks, what's next for the crossword? Oh, um, so one, I think like, <laughs> hi, John. <laughs> um, I, I think some things are really, exciting happening in crossword world. I mentioned diversity really briefly. Um, so something that um, crossword constructors are incredibly mindful of now is that the crossword isn't just in this sort of bubble and like off in the fun supplement and you know like what you read what you read in the crossword you are still reading and absorbing it and it's a part of the world it's not just kind of random filler letters it actually has an opportunity to be um active and active in the life of whatever um publication it's part of whether it's a newspaper or a magazine so crossword constructors are 
um, the the like really exciting ones out there today they're doing really inventive things with wordplay and fun visuals so they're just like great at doing all that stuff but they add this extra layer of um they want to actually like introduce cultural references and introduce references from the whole world into the crossword which like historically had kind of been you know um tailored to upper middle class white men who went to Yale. And like, that is not the audience for the newspaper and magazines anymore. And that is not the audience for the crossword puzzle. And so using the crossword as this place where lots of people can, and like everybody comes together, I think is really exciting. And also is drawing more young people into the crossword, um, which is really cool. And the uh, another thing is like crossword apps, like, I mean, I often do the crossword on my phone, right? So like crossword apps are, um, the technology is getting a lot better for the crosswords. Actually, it's pretty good and it's pretty seamless to do on your phone. It's, it's really nice to do in pen and paper, but um, I think that's another thing. It's like just getting the technology super seamless. Um, but yeah, I think the main thing for me is seeing just the crossword itself kind of become a really lively space to um, learn things and interact with lots of parts of the culture. This is a question from me that the fact that I've only been doing crosswords a little while, I must say when there's an acronym or an abbreviation, I feel that's cheating on the part of the maker. Hmm. Even if the clue is good, and I'm, you know, I'm a dunce about, hmm, let us say, many things, um, but I feel like, oh, you just have to fill in those four letters because the grid was working, and you had to put in some funny acronym. Or as you're saying, I didn't go to Yale, and I'm not going to get that one. I will say I have um, uh, done this with another person, and occasionally we will say, all right, we're looking up the answers, and then sometimes you feel like, oh, well, we're just stupid, and other times you think. No, we were never going to get that. So I didn't actually know the um, New York Times, sorry, I'm admitting my, my own lack of knowledge. Um, I didn't know the New York Times crosswords got harder by day. I would be a Monday man. I'm certain of it. I mean, the, I mean, the fun thing to me about Mondays is that actually they're like really impressive to make a Monday that works well as a Monday because it's got to be solvable and super fun too right you don't just want like a crossword that you're like well okay i can just sort of fill these in mondays are an opportunity to be playful and lively and also like yes i can always do this like <laughs> but yeah it's and it's funny too with the history of the crossword that um when basically the crossword did this kind of um title this big shift um in 1993 when it, the new york times crossword did a shift in its cluing style and Will Shorts took over the crossword in 93. And it had been brewing for a while, but he canonized it of like, you can suddenly clue things with pop culture references, with contemporary references that you couldn't before. And bef and this was a big thing because actually, you know, Bob, you're saying that, wow, acronyms, oh, I can't get any of them. I feel like such a dunce. But then like crossword people love that because they're like, yes everybody else feels like a dunce and i feel superior because like i've learned all the acronyms you know even if you know wherever you're from you know you've done it if you do enough crosswords you learn certain crosswordy words and you learn all the acronyms like you just if you just do enough of them they they, they turn up enough and you know them like my mom will say like my mom will know something sometimes they're like how do you know that and she's like i know that from crosswords <laughs> I, you know, so like you just know things. Um, yeah, so like, uh, um, so where's it going? So yeah, so there was like a sort of outcry when these crosswordy things started going away and the contemporary stuff come, came in. Most people loved it because they said, wow, this crossword, I can actually access it. This crossword represents me. That's great. And some of the diehards were like, Come on, <laughs> like, where's where's my crossword? Uh, this is not this is this is not the original crossword anymore. Um, yeah. I noted on your website that on 
April 23rd through 25th this is the American Crossword Puzzle Tournament mm -hmm. at the Stanford Marriott, though it is remote this year, virtual. And you are doing something on your website that is listed as special game presentation. Can you tell us anything about what you're doing? Because you might excite the audience and they're gonna they're gonna go there. Uh stay tuned. No, um, <laughs> no, 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 I do know. Um so this is the crossword. I actually talk about the crossword tournament in a chapter in the book, but this is um the sort of there's a big crossword tournament every year that's normally in Stanford, Connecticut. Um, it was canceled last year. This year it's going virtual, and the hope is that in 2022, you know, we'll see. But this year it's going virtual, and um, there's been a bunch of virtual tournaments, you know, in this pandemic year. They've been quite successful. But the way that this, um, the main tournament every year is a multi day affair. And so people come in on Friday night, and there's like a teaser warm up word games. And then like Saturday is the big crossword day where you do like 18,000 crosswords and it feels to me like sort of a cross between like doing I don't know like so, like being at a casino and the SATs all at once <laughs> it's very bizarre um it's pretty fun and then like Sundays is the finale but that Friday night I'm gonna be running a word game and I think it's gonna be like a sort of um mad libs trivia like it's sort of a mashup uh this is like for my brother the real trivia champ it's a mashup between crosswords and trivia so that'll be my game if you if anybody wants to register for the crossword tournament um yeah it's it's um about a month and some change from now so just to give another plug for that go to adrian's website adrianrafel.com and you can see all of this information there um upcoming events and and that one in particular um, this is such a family affair for you, Adrian. I would be remiss at 744 if I didn't just unmute everybody and, okay, everybody careful. We're going to have a, we're going to have a free for all now, and we're going to try to do it so that it's either going to get completely out of control. And then I'm going to say, thanks for coming everybody. Bye. Thanks, Adrian. And this is where we'll cut off the, um, the recording, but we got to do this because this is as close as we're going to get tonight even though a bunch of you, we could in this town, we could actually have a drive by because a bunch of people are in this town and they could drive I by know. the afternoon and blow their horns. I'm leaving at 8.30, so don't come up by after that. Anyway, I'm gonna unmute everybody here. I think I have to do it individually because I'm, I'm a little bit of a neophyte here. Let me shut one function off here. Anyway, we're gonna go for this. So we're gonna try to, we can mute all, but how come we can't unmute all? God, do we have to do it I, individually? I see my, um grandmother and my aunt is on here and my yeah wow yeah. and i like all of my hometown family this is really lovely to see everybody yeah, Bob, pardon can... my clumsiness here i think i literally have to ask all of you to unmute i'm going to run down the whole list from top Bob, to bottom I, mean, I, can, I can i can help you too i can oh, i can just press i'm going to press some buttons here good no, <laughs> you know the, the, the speaker has to be the control person here like all right just Ooh. a Okay, unmute it. Yeah, I'm. I'm. Are you I'm, trying to figure out how to unmute? Let me say to uh, and Bob at the Athenaeum oh. that my offer of a year ago is still good. <laughs> um, is that's a that's an inside thing which I'm going to remember, Bob. Yes. Not night tonight, I'll bet, but I'm going to remember. For Adrian to talk to the local community in person. And there will be a reward from autographed books donated by a patron. All right. Thank it's you. Gonna, it's going to happen. I, I wrote to somebody today and I said, as they say on the BBC, and Pat, you will understand this, I get my first jab March 21st. So I'm going to be halfway there, baby. I'm going to be like a free man in Paris, so to speak. So we're, we're, we're going to, oh, I'm going to keep jumping away here too. I'm going to start asking more people to unmute. Okay. Yeah. Hi, Adrian. I unmuted. <laughs> Hi, honey. Hi. <laughs> hello, 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 hello. Hi. And I'm, and I'm, I'm listening from New Haven, Connecticut, though I've been to St. John's Very Athenium. And thank you very much. I cheat on the crosswords. <laughs> and, uh, I, I, I do cheat. too. Hi, Adrian from Haddonfield, New Jersey, your old hometown. 
<laughs> I got all my hometown before here. you grew up before you grew up in Vermont <laughs> I have all my hometown hi Adrian from New York hi <laughs> There's Rachel. So I, I think I've tried to unmute everybody. Some of you, I think, don't want to unmute. That's fine. But if anybody has a question, um, you know, yell first and speak loudest. I will. Hi. Hi. How are Hi, you, Lisa. How are Hi, you? Lisa. It's good That's to see sweet. you. <laughs> good to good see you. you. I'm calling. I'm here from Atlanta. Um, and I wanted to ask you a couple questions that maybe your audience might be interested in. Did other members of your family, besides your mom or your dad, did other members of your family do crossword puzzles in other types? Um, I, I mean, I know some of those answers, but there's some that I don't know either. And did and when and additionally, when you were a child, did you start doing the grid crossword puzzles when you were little? That's you know the one of my of course this is. It comes as a surprise to no one who knows him, but Ben has gotten really into crosswords. <laughs> and really? Yeah, he's gotten really into it. Um, he, I think he had to hop off. He was on for a sec, but he had to hop off to a trivia night, which is also no surprise. Yeah, <laughs> <that's true. laughs> Great. So I can, yeah, no, Ben's gotten really into them. And like, he's also... Like, but, but he's gotten into them because of the phone, because on the phone, the, like what happened, you can, um, the New York Times will tell, if the New York Times app will tell you how fast you did the crossword, right? And it keeps track of like oh, wow. how fast you did them. So you can, you know, record your times and say, you know, text your times to your family members and say have a competition with your family members about who can do the fastest crossword and so yeah so i would say um ben has gotten into now that the crossword has become a competitive sport is where wow. my wow. brother decides that he likes to do that. <laughs> well, he's always made competitive sports out of things that weren't necessarily competitive sports. So, oh, so it's, I... it's just, it's a thrill a minute for Ben. That's the way he is. <laughs> just got an incredible mind. That's oh, neat. Yeah. But what about when you were a child? Did you, uh, I, cause I know I did gridded. Uh, that's how I learned was on graph paper. As a child, I was seven or eight years old when I started. Right, and very simple stuff. And as time went on, it became more and more complicated. And, and it was fun because you could look at a crossword puzzle in the paper and that would give you an idea. I had no uh, uh, instrumentation otherwise, other than just kind of playing around with different clues and, and having fun with it and, and developing a theme. I think the thematic element is so important in, in talking about crossword puzzles. Well, yeah, and I think, um... I also remember, um, you know, it's funny because my, my love of crosswords like started, I think with um, other word puzzles, right? And I remember like, I mean, your dad, my grandpa Irv was yeah. really like, I don't remember him seeing, seeing him do crosswords, but he did this puzzle called the Crypt, he did the Crypt Equip, equip yeah. the Crypt Equip, which is like, it's a puzzle I think only somehow exists in the like the Atlantic City Press, maybe my grandma who's on here can like uh, corroborate this, but like it's a puzzle I've only ever seen Grandpa Irv do. Yeah. Um, it's a, like it's like a match. It's like kind of like a cross between a cipher and a crossword. Like you like match up you you finish it. Like Nora Gare knows what this is. <laughs> and, then it's, and then the word the word has to be jumbled. You have to unjumble yeah. the uh, unscramble the words so that you can get get the answer to the the question um, based upon a car cartoon picture almost. So yeah, uh, exactly. But, yeah. But, so like my so Grandpa Earl was really good at them, so I'd watch him do them, and then I got good at Boggle. So Boggle yes. is my game. Yes. That's like my true passion in life. Yeah. And if anybody would like to commission me, you know, like to send me a contract to write a book about boggle in which I just like sit there and play yeah. boggle for a while I'm I'm your gal um <laughs> that's a Parker Brothers uh game too you have to talk to the Parker Brothers people who are probably in and um in cahoots with Milton Bradley there's all probably only one conglomeration now at this in this world 
Yep. So, but, but you were a boggle. You were, and, and our whole family was, was boggleized, shall we say? That's a new word, boggleized. But, but my, um, your grandfather, my father, did crossword puzzles almost every day. They took longer. That was yeah. the whole point. If he had the time, he would make it a point to do that. And as I got older, he would say, he would ask you a question, you know, it's just like, do you, I don't know if you remember when he used to quiz everybody about the capitals of the United States. So, yeah. um, but it, it, when we were children, when we were small children, so he did that with all the grandchildren too. But, but still, it was, it, was a, it was a very instrumental and integral part of his life on a daily basis. It became a habit, so. Mm -hmm. So, but I just wonder whether that was the, part of the influence. And did you ever do any crossword puzzles when you were young? Did you invent them? Yeah, it's, um, I think the first crosswords I wrote were in for um, Capstone for Jenny's class senior <laughs> year, I think. And that was like, I think, um, I, I do remember when I was much younger than that like I, I think I, I have some like little I was I've been trying to think about this I have like little diary entries of when I was like a little kid of like playing with letters and I have notebooks of like um you know when I was figuring out how to like think about like what is a poem what is poetry I have like lots of sort of word games around that and I would like play a lot with like sort of letter combinations and stuff but I think the first time I really tried to make crosswords seriously was senior year of high school for that project and then I didn't make them for a while and then I got back into it but um but yeah I mean I when I was little I I have lots of different like um notebooks of different kinds of word games mm -hmm. and stuff but for sure that's neat well and that's what started it all that's yeah so a couple more right. questions one yeah. from the list this is from sharon um and sharon is i'm just gonna say your name jack there is do i have it right anyway i hope i do um she's mm -hmm. asking will the new york times ever be knocked off its perch as the preeminent crossword and this is a question from me do you find crosswords to be a solitary um, event or are they just as much fun if you work with somebody else? Do you think they're, they're primarily a, a solitary thing? So I'll, I'll, those are both great questions. Um, I'll, and I'll answer both of them. I'll take Sharon's first really quick um, because the New York Times crossword, I, I think that the great thing about the crossword landscape, the other cool thing about the future of crosswords is that there are lots of other crosswords that are um, coming into prominence now. I mean, like with the internet and with the ability to kind of get media from everywhere, um, like lots of, I mean, lots of publications have always had crosswords, but um, there's lots of independent crosswords that are coming up. Lots of the construct, like the New Yorker is a crossword. The Atlantic is a crossword. The Wall Street Journal is a crossword. I mean, I like, but there are lots of just independent, like people and constructors who just send out crossword newsletters to each other, you know? So like, th this has always been happening, but it's just proliferated with the internet. Um, so if the New York Times crossword, I, like, it's funny if you talk to constructors now, that like some of them will be like, well, the New York Times is just totally going downhill and it's already, it's already jumped the shark or whatever the proper <laughs> crossword version of that would be. Um, I think the New York Times has such a stronghold, just like, uh, it's just so dominant um, historically that I don't think it's gonna be knocked off its perch for a while just because it's just like, it's just so overwhelmingly popular and sort of known as like the name brand crossword. Um, I will say, I think competition's good for it. I think the Times crossword, it's been challenged in terms of it's <laughs> the diversity of things that show up in the New York Times crossword, the diversity of constructors, all the stuff that like the creativity of the, that crossword. I think um, it's gonna continue to be challenged. And if it doesn't grow and evolve, some other publications crossword will take over eventually. Not for a while, but I mean, also the financial back, the financial backing behind the New York Times crossword is absolutely like insane. Too. Like this, that, that's another thing that's just gonna keep them at the top of the game just because like they're just, uh, you can, they're just financially dominant. Um, but Bob, your question about 
crosswords of solitary versus um, a group or like a group activity. I found actually like the um, COVID, and we were talking about this Bob a little bit before everybody came on, but things like the very, very, very few things that have actually been a benefit of COVID or have like learned something through this pandemic, right? And one thing that I have really learned and was really crystallized is that the way in, ways in which crosswords are sneakily extremely social, even though they're definitely like, I'm there in my room just by myself solving a crossword, like, um, and maybe, and I'm obviously a very biased sample size, but one of the like ways in which I really enjoyed socializing with people during the pandemic is talking about crosswords. Like separately from the book, I have sort of running text threads of, you know, a friend of mine were competing over Saturday crossword times or like thinking about just like, if you don't, but this like extends beyond this of, you know, if you don't have, and this is pre-pandemic and post-pandemic times too, is, the crossword provides sort of a natural thing to talk about when it can be hard to strike up, a, it can be awkward to strike up a conversation and you don't know what to talk about. Like, I, you know, it's like, but then you're like, oh, the crossword, like, oh, wow, eight down, this actress, do you know what that is? I don't know. Like, let's think about this other corner here. So solving together can be this really kind of fun, collaborative way. And then, and then the clues will spark conversation. So it's like, you know, it's, um, it's great to play other games together, but the clues might spark something of, oh yeah, I read that book um, back in, you know, high school. I love that book. I can't remember the main character's name, but do you remember this thing? Or, oh yeah, this, you know, so like clues will end up sort of sparking avenues for conversation in really cool ways. And um, yeah, and I mean, there are like the crossword, it, it can be solitary, it can be a way for you to escape from the world, but it also can be sort of this like um, vibrant place to connect with, um, you know, your friends, your relatives, your family, when you can't be like together, the crossword ends up really pulling people together. And I, I saw that as I was writing the book, I definitely saw that while writing the book, but I saw that in so much more magnitude this past year. And it's really, it's, been a delight to I love the social aspect of the crossword. Adrian, it has been a fantastic hour with you and your family members and friends and other people who who may be in um, well, they're in one of those categories or they're, they're just attendees. Thank you everybody for coming. It's eight o'clock or 7.59 and um, we, we should leave them wanting. So <laughs> I feel bad about ending the house party for your family. <laughs> <laughs> but I think um, Jenny says, thanks, Adrian. Thanks, Bob. Jenny, thank you. It, it was really great to do this. And it, was, um, it, wasn't, it wasn't a catastrophe letting everybody speak who wanted to. So Adrian, thank you so much. It was fantastic as I, I will say this, I knew it would be. Oh, well, thank you so much, Bob. And oh, it's so good to see everybody. <laughs> I miss you and love all of you guys. And thank you so much for coming.